Welcome back to 12 Days in March. This special edition of the Urine Review features real cases from my medical practice. In this case, we'll discuss a patient who demonstrated a common acid-base disturbance. That said, students remain unfamiliar with some of the test derivatives, so we will attack them in this discussion. As with other cases, these questions aren't perfect, but the teaching points are spot on. As with all presentations, a PDF of this recording is available for free download at the website. Here is the first in a four-question series. Please pause the recording to answer each question. Do note that some of the questions are looking for least likely answers. Good luck. And question number two. And here is question number three. To answer this question correctly, you need to be familiar with compensation formulas. And finally, the last question. Okay, here goes. Here we have a basic chemistry panel on this patient, and we're asked to sort out the scenario. My initial step will be to focus on the plasma bicarb, expressed as CO2. In an acid-base question, the first step is to determine what the primary disturbance is. An elevated bicarb suggests a metabolic alkalosis, and I've included the modified Henderson-Hasselbalch equation for simplicity, if that equation can be considered simple. Elevation of the denominator, which is bicarb, will result in a decrease in hydrogen ion concentration expressed as an alkalotic state. We'll be using Henderson-Hasselbalch in the next question, so I thought it worth introducing early on. So the high bicarb can also represent compensation for respiratory acidosis. Looking at the question, if the PCO2 rises, so does the hydrogen ion concentration. So the bicarb will rise in the body's attempt to normalize pH. So a high bicarb in isolation either means a primary metabolic alkalosis or secondary compensation. We'll return to compensation shortly. Back to the question. They are asking about the least likely cause of metabolic alkalosis. Fortunately, metabolic alkalosis has a narrow differential diagnosis for step one. Here are the choices. Volume contraction, vomiting, or mineralocorticoid excess. I use the term mineralocorticoid excess to describe both aldosterone and cortisol, as cortisol in high concentration has the same mineralocorticoid properties as aldosterone. So these are the causes. That's it. Mercifully straightforward. Looking at the choices, there are no respiratory issues, so we don't have to deal with compensation issues just yet. Based on the differential diagnosis, diarrhea represents the least likely cause to generate a metabolic alkalosis. In fact, quite the opposite. You dump bicarb in your stool, and this leads to a non-anion gap metabolic acidosis. On the boards, you will most assuredly see a question on non-anion gap acidosis related to diarrhea. As for the other choices and mechanisms of alkalosis, diuretics, refractory hypertension, and glucocorticoids all result in stimulation of the hydrogen ATPase pump located in the collecting tubules, with consequent wasting of hydrogen ions and retention of bicarb. Although you wouldn't necessarily know that refractory hypertension is synonymous with high aldosterone, the NBME does take liberty with the concept listing patients with blood pressure out of control plus high bicarb and usually low potassium as synonymous with hyperaldosteronism. In this discussion, you were only given high bicarb and refractory hypertension. This is board speak for hyperaldosteronism. Whether you recognize that association or not, it didn't really matter as diarrhea was clearly the odd man out. Insofar as vomiting, pretty straightforward. You puke up hydrogen ions. Less hydrogen ions leads to an alkalotic state. And as an FYI, just to underscore alkalosis associated with vomiting, this state is also associated with volume contraction. Volume contraction, in turn, will stimulate aldosterone secretion. So the answer to question one is diarrhea. Continuing, the concept of a low urinary chloride is a major point of confusion for students. But let's keep life simple. With vomiting, we are volume deplete, as just mentioned. How will your body respond? Elevated aldosterone levels. This leads to maximal absorption of sodium. Sodium, a cation, must be absorbed with an anion. In the principal cell, that anion will be chloride. So what's the result? 
in volume deplete states, there will be a low urinary chloride. If you can hold on to this concept, you are in good shape. Here is where it gets a little confusing. Pay attention. The opposite is seen in states of mineralocorticoid excess. In these states, you are volume replete, and that is the key concept. Once replete, the body has escape mechanisms, interestingly enough called aldosterone escape. The mechanism of aldosterone escape will be discussed in a separate video, but the general principle is that we eventually hit a new homeostasis with sodium absorption, and eventually you cease to absorb it in excess. And that just makes intuitive sense, right? Think about it. Patients with hyperaldosteronism would literally blow up and explode if a homeostasis point wasn't achieved. At some point, the excess sodium and chloride will need to be excreted, and that will show up in the urine. So the take home here is that volume depletion sucks up as much sodium and chloride as possible with a low urine chloride. If you are volume replete, as seen in mineralocorticoid excess, the body eventually dumps the excess chloride. As such, urine chloride is a useful tool in distinguishing the different causes of metabolic alkalosis. As far as spironolactone, this agent is an aldosterone receptor antagonist, thereby blocking the effects of aldosterone. As such, not only do you not have alkalosis, but it causes a non-anion gap metabolic acidosis, just as seen in adrenal insufficiency and diarrhea. Moving on, in this question, we take a quick shot at interpreting blood gases. So what is the first step? Determine the acid-base status. Is he acidotic or alkalotic? And we know from high school chemistry, the patient's pH of 7.35 is acidotic. Step two is to determine the primary disturbance. Which of the two elevated values, the PCO2 of 50 or the bicarb of 38, will cause an acidotic state? I again showed the modified Henderson-Hasselbach equation. We are asked which of the two choices will raise the hydrogen ion concentration. The answer is obvious, the PCO2. So to answer the question, which is the primary disturbance, the answer is respiratory acidosis. But now we have to determine whether this is a simple or mixed disturbance. To accomplish this, we need to sort out the expected compensation. To determine the compensation, we calculate the degree of PCO2 elevation, which is 10 above the normal value of 40. If the PCO2 is elevated by 10, what is the normal compensatory response of bicarb? The answer is 1 millimole for an acute increase of 10, or it increases by 3 millimoles for a chronic elevation. This is one of the few facts I ask students to memorize. It makes life easy. Metabolic compensation is described as either acute or chronic. I remember the compensations for respiratory acidosis by recalling that acidosis is bad luck, as is the number 13. 1 millimole for acute respiratory acidosis and 3 millimoles for chronic. So let's apply the compensation rule. As the CO2 is increased by 10, I applied the chronic rule of 3. In this instance, it didn't matter if I calculated the expected compensation as 1 or 3, since the bicarb of 38 is so far in excess of the expected value, we know there is a mixed disturbance. Applying this information, we know the patient has respiratory acidosis based on the initial determination of pH and PCO2. But we also know the patient has metabolic alkalosis as the bicarb is in excess of predicted. So this ABG presents a mixed disturbance. All that remains is to plug in the diseases that account for these disorders. And here they are. COPD, or hypoventilation, are the major causes of respiratory acidosis. The choices only offer COPD. So we need to determine the least likely scenario for metabolic alkalosis, and this is similar to the earlier discussion. In this instance, acetazolamide is least likely as this causes metabolic acidosis through urinary wasting of bicarb. In this question, the patient would be losing bicarb in the urine instead of the stool. The incorrect options cause metabolic alkalosis on the basis of volume contraction, loss of hydrogen ions, or mineralocorticoid excess. So in this fun little exercise, we looked at the causes of metabolic alkalosis and how they will be presented on the boards. We addressed the tricky topic of measuring urine chloride. 
we also demonstrated a stepwise approach to ABG interpretation and practiced applying compensation rules to sort out a mixed disturbance. This is complex stuff, but if you develop a systematic approach, you'll be able to sort these out on test day. And that concludes this edition of the Year in Review. If you have any questions or concerns, please email me at 12 Days in March. Thank you.